forgive us of every sin we we'll ever commit, but He wants to give us freedom from future sins, future condemnation. Romans eight chapter one, uh, or Romans eight one and two says, "So now there is no condemnation." You have sermon notes; you're welcome to use them. But I want you to highlight that because that's what we're talking about. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. For the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you through Christ Jesus from the power of sin that leads to death. That's a wonderful promise. If I belong to Jesus Christ, I will never be condemned. There's no reason to fear the judgment that is out there before us. Because I have already been declared innocent. I've been declared innocent through the sacrifice of Jesus. I want to look this morning at three freedoms for those who belong to Jesus Christ. We have been set free. What are those freedoms? What are we free from as Christ followers this morning? First of all, we are free from sin's power in our lives. Free from sin's power. Uh, how many of you have flown in a big 747? I uh, think all of us. Those things are massive. I don't know about you, but some of the thoughts that I have when I'm on that plane is, and there's a lot of people on this plane. Uh, okay, we all weigh about 150 to 200 pounds. There's how many of us on here? Everybody has two suitcases. Man, we're, we're weighting this plane down. And not only is that the weight on a plane, but uh, this plane is huge. It's massive. And its size, you're thinking, wow, how is this thing going to get off the ground? Uh, it's just amazing to me. But the power of the engines, of those jet engines, and the laws of aerodynamics take this plane from off the ground 35,000 feet up into the air and travel at over 600 miles an hour. At the same time, it's going up. At the whole time, gravity is pulling on this plane. But as long as it obeys the laws of aerodynamics, it can break free from the bonds of earth. Think about the power of sin in your life and the pull of gravity on that jet. Think about our, our, the power of sin. The power of sin is always trying to pull you down. Discourage you. Keep you down here. It's pulling you down. It's trying to get you to follow the opposite of God's will for your life. It would appear that it controls you. But the power of God's Holy Spirit, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, we can pull away from the sin that has dominated our lives so that we can soar a life. Romans 8 verse 2 says this, For the power of the life-giving Spirit has, underline the rest of uh, these words, has freed you through Christ Jesus from the power of sin. We are free from the power of sin. The power of sin which leads to death. So what has the Spirit done for us? He has equipped you, He has equipped me to pull away from sin. I do not need to be under the control of it any longer. I have everything that I need within me as a child of God to not give in to that temptation when it comes. Why? Because I've been given the freedom and the power to sin no longer conquers my life. I have the ability as a child of God to withstand the onslaught of the enemy because residing in me is the spirit of the living God with all of His power to help me to deal with that when sin comes. I'm no longer in bondage to it. In fact, we know that all of us sin. Anybody here not sin? See, everybody, everybody sins. We know that we're all sinners. Uh, and, and when we become Christians, it's like I think sometimes we think that we're going to be this perfect Christian and never sin. I wish that was the case, but even Christians sin. But the sin that we commit is not committed because we don't have control over it. The sin is committed because for a fleeting moment or for a long period of time, we have chosen not to exercise our control over it. Here's a question. 
Have you ever set a personal goal to go the entire day without sitting? Think about that. Have you ever said, hey, today I am not going to sin? See, I doubt that many of us have done that because we bought into the lie that we all live a, a sinful life, a lifestyle. Even as a Christian, we're, we're going to live and we're going to sin. Well, that's true. But we bought into that. But I want us to understand that God has given you and I the power to overcome sin in our lives. He expects us to live holy. He expects us to be committed to His standards that He's put into our lives for our benefit. So none of us have an excuse. Uh, none of us have an excuse to give it to the sins when we're tempted to commit. On the other hand... We have the ultimate power over sin because even when we do not allow God's power uh, to overcome that sin in our lives, we give in to it. We give in to that sin and then we're forgiven for committing that sin. We are free from sin's power both in the sense that we can control it and if we don't control it, we're still forgiven. Here's the danger. The danger lies in thinking that since God's promised to forgive me of my sin, it doesn't make any difference if I sin or not. But that's hardly the case. God expects us and has given us His standards. He has equipped, equipped us um, to live by these standards, and we know that God's displeased when we don't live by His standards. But like any father, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. He loves us even though we don't reach His standards. <laughs> He's shown us the way. And, and the good thing about it is when we get off track, and if you find yourself off track today, what do you do? Get back on track. Get back on track. And, and he'll make us whole. So bottom line as a believer, we are free from sin's power. It no longer has power over my life because I've been set free because of what Jesus did for me. Here's the second thing we're free of. We're free... From sin's penalty. There's a penalty for sin. Suppose there was a man who committed murder. And he was caught red-handed. He admitted to the crime and he decided that he had no choice other than to plead I'm guilty. The day for his trial comes and he enters his plea. And the judge sitting there hears this man's plea. Um, he not only hears his confession, but the judge sees all the evidence, and he knows, the judge knows that this man is completely guilty, uh, and he has committed this crime. The judge ruled that this man's committed the crime, and here's the penalty for your crime, and the pen penalty will be paid. Yet, instead of punishing the man who committed the crime, the judge volunteered to take the death penalty for this man who is guilty. By virtue of the judge's personal sacrifice, uh, the judge's personal sacrifice, the man who committed the crime was not condemned and, and he doesn't have to suffer the consequences. The judge paid his penalty. Now that sounds pretty familiar to what somebody's done for us, right? We are all guilty as charged because we've all sinned. We've all sinned, and every one of us has sinned against God, and there's no doubt that we are guilty. The wages of our guilt, the wages of our sin, is what? Death. There's a penalty. We should be separated from God eternally. We are experiencing death because of sin. There's a penalty. But God, the great judge of all, stepped in and says, I'm going to make this right. I'm going to send my only son, and my son came, and he took the hit for you and for me. We deserve death. We deserve to be separated from God. And Jesus stepped in and said, I'll pay the price for you. And that's exactly what he did. He paid the price for our penalty. And he set us free. The penalty was paid, but it wasn't paid by you and me. Romans 3, verses 23 and 24 says, For all of sin, all, all of us fall short of God's glory standard. Yet now God, in His gracious kindness, underline these next four words, in God's gracious kindness, declares us not guilty. Roscoe, you're not guilty. Bunny, you're not guilty. 
every one of us, you are not guilty. He has done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sins. Romans 5, 8, 9 says, I want to show you this great love. God shows great love for us, underlined by sending Christ to die for us. I want everybody in this room to understand that Christ died for you, personally. And for everyone in this world, while we were still sinners, we weren't perfect. We weren't living by His standards. He died for us while we were yet sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, underline the rest of it, this, He will certainly save us from God's judgment. See, we're saved from sin's penalty because of one thing, Christ's death on the cross, His sacrifice, His shed blood. The Word says that we're saved from God's judgment. We have nothing to fear. There will be a judgment day. But through Christ, He set us free from our penalty. And I don't have to face judgment because I'm free from that. He will certainly save us from God's judgment. Romans 8, 1, There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. That is a wonderful promise. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been freed from the penalty of sin through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And someday we will stand before that great judgment day. And we will get to pass by the judgment. Because we are free. Our penalty, we are free. I believe that God's promises are true. And that we can face that final day, that a judgment day, that He's going to just usher us in right in the presence of God. When you watch movies or TV, there's this particular theme sometimes that you hear. How one person saves the life of another person. And what does that person do who is saved? Usually in the movie or TV, what do they do? They try to say, oh, I'm your servant. I'll, do, I'll serve you the rest of my life. I'll do whatever I can to pay you back because you saved my life. You see that a lot in TV and, and common themes. Friends, our lives have been saved by the living God. There's no way that we can pay Him back. But don't you think we should try? Don't you think we should do whatever we can to say, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. But I can't pay Him back for what He's done for me. But I can change the way that I live. Uh, when God, when you realize that God has literally changed your life, I don't want to be the same person. I, I want to be confident in my future. I want to live in obedience to God. I want to live my life out of gratitude because I have a gift I don't deserve. But out of gratitude, I want to do and be all that I can be for you. And, and, and that still will be enough, but I'm going to try to do it because I love you. Because I appreciate the gift that you've given to me. But how is it that even though we have this great gift, we, can, we still fall off the track. We do. I don't want to, but we fall off the track. That's where it is. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I encourage you. You love them. I know you do. Get back on the track. You'll never be able to do enough. It's not about doing. But the doing comes out of a heart of gratitude that I love you. I love you. I am indebted to you for a gift that I definitely don't deserve. So how do we live that way? To, to live our lives as saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the gift that is so freely been given to me. Well, here's the third one. We are free to live by the Spirit. You can if you want. You're free to live by the Spirit. I'm going to tell you a true story. It was about a place called Gates Field. It was during the Depression that there was this man named Yates who had a sheep ranch. And just operating this sheep ranch, he could hardly make enough money to pay the principal interest on this ranch. And with a little bit of, of money, he could hardly buy clothes, he could hardly buy food. And like him, with a lot of other families, they had to live on government subsidy just to make it. And day after day, I'm sure he took his sheep out there and was rolling West Texas hills. And, and there's no doubt he's wondering, am I going to lose the ranch? I don't have the money. What are we going to do? Then a, size, a 
seismographic crew, uh, uh, crew from an oil company came into the area and they said, uh, we think that you have oil on your land and we would like to sign a contract and do a well, a what you call wild cat well, and he signed the lease to allow him to do that. The first wildcat well that they drilled on his land at 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. The first well came out 80,000 barrels of oil a day. That's a lot. And many subsequent wells were more than twice as large. In fact, 30 years later, after this discovery of oil was made, the government went in and did a test and found out that the potential flow uh, of oil was 125,000 barrels of oil a day. And Mr. Yates owned it all. The day that he purchased the land, he purchased the rights and the mineral rights to his, the oil rights and mineral rights to his land. And here it had been, here he was living on relief from the government. Uh, he was a multi-millionaire living in poverty. What was the problem? The problem was he didn't know that he had oil. He, didn't, he owned it, but he didn't know he had oil. Why did I tell you that story? Because sometimes I believe that many Christians live in spiritual poverty. We are given and entitled to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and His energizing spirit and power that we're not aware of our birthright. We want to live in obedience to God. We want to find the power to help us see through. It's right here in front of us. And I want to live in gratitude to God. I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But I don't know that it's there. I have to tap into it. See, I'm free from sin's power and all. I am free from sin's condemnation. And I want to live by God's standards. And I want to live out of gratitude for what He's done for me. But I find it hard to accomplish. And I think we find ourselves there a lot. I want to live this way. God, I want to please you. And I keep falling off the train. The problem is sometimes I don't think we fully understand the ramification of what God's done for us. If he's freed me from sin's power, that means I have the ability not to sin. If he's freed me from sin's penalty, that means that I don't have to fear the future. The bottom line is this. I'm completely free. You are completely free to live in obedience to God. Period. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4 says this. Listen, this is what God destroyed. God destroyed sin's control over us by giving his, giving his Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the requirement of the law would be fully accomplished for us. We will no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Before becoming a, a follower of Christ, we had no choice. We were enslaved to the sinful nature. We had no real power to overcome that sinful nature of our lives. But as Christians, we now have a choice. We can either follow the sinful nature, or we can follow the Spirit. I have a choice today, right now. I have a choice. Sinful nature or the Spirit. See, God, what well, all He's done for us, He He has done it in such a way saying, hey, I don't want you to stay the same. I, I, want, I want you to live a changed life. There's something better for us. A life lived in line with His will, with the power to do all that He wants us to do, and He's given us the ability to resist what, what He wants us to avoid. And if we take, uh, it's all for ours if we just listen. <laughs> If we just listen to the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. This morning I don't have a three-point plan or three-step plan of how we're going to make this happen. How am I going to live by the Spirit? I don't have a three-point step. I think it's much simpler than that. I just simply, you just simply have to make a choice to listen to the Spirit and reject sin. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's all we got to do. 
And I find that there has never been a committed sin that I didn't commit that I chose not to listen to the Holy Spirit. I chose to do what I wanted to do. That's the bottom line. And I have no doubt that that's true for you as, I, you as well. I sin because I choose not to follow the Spirit. I do not sin when I follow the Spirit. It's as simple as that. So let's begin today to consciously choose to live in the freedom of the Spirit that's given to you and I to do what's right. It's a daily thing. I'll give you a little homework. Tomorrow, Monday morning when we get up and have your breakfast, say, Lord, today, I'm making it my personal decision and, and choice. I'm going to do my best. I'm not, I'm not going to sin. I'm going to do my best. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to sin today. And then get up the next day and say, Lord, today, thank you for your gift. Thank you that I'm free. I'm not going to sin today. And make that your aim. Now, if you do sin, okay, you're forgiven. Get back on the track and say, Lord, here we go again. I am making my aim. I am free. And I'm tapping into the power of your Holy Spirit. Because you didn't go to the cross for me that I could continue to slip in my sin. You set me free. And I'm a sinful person saved by you. But I don't want to keep doing the things that put you to the cross. I don't want to continue to hurt you because I love you. So I want to do my best every day to say, I want to follow the Spirit. It's my desire. I would hook, hook into that jet engine that propels me away from the thing that puts you to the cross. But Lord, help me. It's my choice. Nobody else can do it for me. But it's my choice to tap in, to be set free from the power of sin, to be set free from the penalty of sin, to be set free to live by your Spirit. It's as simple as that. There's no condemnation. We are loved forever. But we have a gift that we don't deserve. And I, I can't ever repay it. But today, I want to make it my aim not to do the things that put you to the cross. But if I do, I want to be quick to say, well, oh, I'm so sorry. I want to get back on the track and I want to plug into your power to help me. But I want to do those things that put you to the cross. Why? Because I love you. And I know that you love me. And I'm going to do everything in my power and in my choice to do that so I'll be pleasing to you. So no matter where you find yourself, if you find yourself off the track, get back on the track. If you have never invited Jesus Christ and you're saying, I don't know that I'm free, free from the power of sin, free from the power of the penalty of that sin, I want to be free. Would you come as we sing this closing song? Closing song is number 500 and 70s.